The book, Semiology of Graphics, is a pioneering work in data visualization. It's the name of the textbook for what I'd like to teach you today. How to make graphics systematically. You may think graphics are separate from information. You may think graphics should be constructed by artists. But what about a graphics system to express information? It does not belong to the artist. In particular, you don't have to be a famous artist like Salvador Dali in order to utilize the graphics system. It belongs to anyone communicating information. Give me a half an hour to convince you that information needs graphics. First, I'd like you to try an exercise. Take out a piece of paper and take five minutes to sketch a graphic. And I'll give you the parameters for the graphic now. Here's a table from the Census Bureau, a subset of manufacturing data from Oregon from 2007. The table contains 133,000 rows. Um, It contains 36 counties in Oregon. So you can see here, we, we see at first Benton County and then mostly Clackamas County. All manufacturing subsectors, total sales, hours worked, wages, industry in Oregon counties. How would you graphically portray some or all of this data? That's the question. The whole table, by the way, I've downloaded from the Census Bureau and put it online. But you don't need it. I wouldn't, I wouldn't bother to download it uh, unless you're really obsessive. Uh, instead, let me just show you a, uh, another example. Um, pretend that you're going to give the table and a sketch to an assistant to polish. So just take five minutes to prepare the sketch. This just has to be good enough for your assistant to understand what the graphic is. And here's the uh, complete set of columns in the table. You can see that many of the uh, values are footnoted instead of the instead of showing actual values so let me just read off the values so we have the geographic area name that's the name of a county we have its um, North American industrial classification code so it's just a number we have the meaning of that code so that's that's the important thing that's the the uh, manufacturing subsector uh, the year which is always 2007 that doesn't change percent estimated uh, number of establishments, this is in that sector. Um, the percent estimated is the percent of manufacturing estimated. Number of establishments in that sector, the number of establishments that have 20 or more employees, the total number of employees where that's known, uh, the annual payroll where that's known, the production workers average per year, the number of production workers hours in thousands of hours, and then the remaining uh, five columns are in uh, thousands of dollars. That's um, production workers' wages, value added, total cost of materials, total value of shipments, and total capital expenditures. So these are, are all the columns that you have to work with, and there are um, plenty of, of rows of these for uh, a total of uh, 36 counties. So just Take a look at these and don't get too uh, obsessed with the details. I want you to think about how the graphic would look if you had time to work out all the numbers. And while you do that, I'll show you some images. So I image Googled statistics on Oregon County. So these are all uh, counties in Oregon. So I wanted to see what um, statistics we have <laughs> available on Oregon counties. And um, here are some of the results I got. And these are just random. These are in no special order. So here's a map. It shows the, uh, the counties. This is called a chloropleth map in that it shows the uh, information in uh, color on regions. Here's a bar chart. Um, one of the bars is for the state as a whole. The other bars are for particular, some particular counties. Um, here's a line chart. Um, shows uh, Oregon as a whole and one county in particular and then I think that's Healthy People 2000 is a nationwide survey that got um, cut off. 
In fact, a lot of these are cut off. For example, the top of this is cut off. It's not so important that you see the, the details, just that you get a general idea of what the um, graphical types are. So here's one that has, um, in, in fact, this came up under statistics on Oregon counties. This is not of counties. This is of uh, metropolitan areas. And it happens that the uh, highest performing um, metropolitan areas on the Oregon and Washington border. I suppose that's why it came up. Here again is a chloropleth map of uh, counties um, or of actually of regions uh, containing counties. Uh, another bar chart, a sideways bar chart. A, um, oh, what do you call these? Uh, these are sometimes called river diagrams or area diagram, area area polygons or something like that. I forget the, the name of it. Uh, here is a series of um, box and whiskers plots and the position of the boxes as well as the boxes themselves give us some information about the counties. And finally here is a, uh, another chloropleth map. This is just of different, uh, different counties. Okay, so I want you to um, pause the video, finish your graphic, and then take up again on the next. I'll, I'll uh, advance the slides and, and start up again. Okay, so presumably you have finished your, um, your picture, and uh, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about this book, uh, Semiology of Graphics by Jacques Bertin. This was unknown in English-speaking countries until this very popular book made it okay for quant people to talk about graphics. So this book, Visual Display of Quantitative Information, um, is kind of the, uh, and this is just a photograph of my somewhat beaten up copy of it. Um, this is the uh, basis for Bertin originally gaining popularity in English-speaking countries, although since then the, the uh, semiology of graphics has been translated into English a couple of times. Now the basic problem that you just tackled was, should we use a diagram or a map? And if you chose a diagram, should you use one diagram or three diagrams? Should it be a, if you choose one diagram, should it be a scatter plot or a distribution? If you chose a map, should it be a cartogram or a map? If you chose a map, should it be circles or columns? There are all kinds of choices that you've just made. And you chose something that Beltane calls retinal variables, that is, the variables that can be perceived by your retina to match to relationships. And these include the planar dimensions, that is, the x-coordinate and the y-coordinate of some mark on the page as well as size, value, texture, color, orientation, and shape. And you should be able to see from the um, particular uh, symbols here what he means by size, value, texture, color, orientation, and shape. He uses a lot of terms a little bit differently than they would be used in common English. And some of this is due to translations. In some cases, the, the translator in my edition of this book, used a lot of footnotes to um, discuss Beltane's terminology. All right, let's drill down into one retinal variable, color, and Beltane's take on that variable. And I'm going to use a different example for this. Instead of Oregon, I'll use France, which, was, which Beltane was fond of in, in his uh, diagrams. So imagine that you have some statistic for each county. Of course, in France, I think they're called departments instead of counties or something else. But uh, let's s suppose that we have counties and we have one statistic uh, on each county. So how could we represent that statistic by color? We can easily perceive bins by value. And value you might think of as intensity uh, or density. We can try the color spectrum, but there's something wrong with this. What could it be? Pause the video while you think about that. Now we'll move on. We see the spectrum as a wheel, not as a line. So consequently, blue and magenta are close together on the wheel. They're far apart on this line, but they're close together on the, the wheel. 
So what if instead we cut the line in a cut the wheel in a different place to make a line? So this is a much uh, better in terms of perceptibility uh, set of colors than the set that we had before. You may, like me, think that the colors are, are kind of hideous, um, and I can't really explain that. Uh, another, they're not. They're certainly not. I should point out that Beltane's book is, in some respects, kind of dated. We certainly, uh, at least in popular usage, all of Beltane's followers use different color schemes than Beltane himself used. Um, he has plenty of followers today, but. Um, but they never use these color schemes, and we'll I'll discuss in some detail color schemes that we will uh, use and talk about because there's been a lot of research on color since Beltane's time. Okay, so here's another solution with contours uh, and the original color choice. Here's a color choice that uh, Beltane asks what uh, what you think of. So you may want to pause the video again while you think about what it, what it is, um, what, what you think of this color choice. And then I'll move on. And Beltane's verdict is that it's pretty and without meaning. These colors don't do anything to help us understand where the statistic is large or small in any given county. Okay, so back to the exercise. So please think about how you would do it now. So again, pause the video, and then um, think about how you would how you might change your picture now. You don't have to actually do it, but just think about it, and then resume the video. Okay, so Beltan is proposing a system for producing graphics. Underlying these examples is a process in which we analyze the information to determine the visual aspects best suited to each kind of information. So let's look at that process in a little bit. I'm just going to scratch the surface. The invariant is the first thing to look at. Begin to analyze the information by identifying the invariant. That's the thing that will stay the same across all relationships in the graphic before considering the components, which are the things that change in the graphic. The invariant is the topic of the graphic. For instance, sales by county or labor by county. The invariant gives us the title for the graphic. Step one takes no account of persuasion or provocation because the system strives for the single goal of supporting immediate answers to simple questions about the information. So the invariant is the uh, title of the graphic is not meant to be provocative or persuasive. It simply supports immediate answers to simple questions about the information. Step two is to consider the components, and each component will be represented by a legend on the graph, and the components are what vary in the graph, such as sales, type of timber, market rank, the things that differ. Each component has three properties to analyze to determine the next steps, order, length, and level, and these three words are given precise definitions in, this, in the system. So I'll, next I'll... I'll uh, say what these three are. Order ranges from components considered as raw values to fractions of components governed by some criteria, for instance, workers on the one hand and workers by county on the other hand. Length of a component refers to the number of divisions we can identify in it. Fewer than four will lead to special constructions while more than a dozen will lead to standard constructions, and I'll discuss what I mean by constructions in a later lecture. We won't go into that today. The level of a component refers to whether the com concept is nominal, ordered, or quantitative, and again we'll go into that in a future lecture. So now back to the exercise. Think again about how you would do it now, just thinking in terms of the invariant and the components and that brings us to the end of this very short introduction to Bertin. The next presentation will be a more detailed look at uh, Bertin's book. Thank you very much for your attention.